Welcome to this module on Special Patient Populations and the Pediatric Patient. Upon completion of this module, you should be able to explain why pediatric patients need varying approaches to assessment and care, identify the developmental considerations for the following age groups, infants, toddlers, preschool, middle childhood, and adolescent. Consider the metabolic differences in providing care to the pediatric patient. Identify the anatomical and physiological differences to consider in the care of the pediatric patient in the following areas, head, airway, chest, lung, abdomen, extremities, integumentary system, respiratory system, circulatory system, nervous system, and spinal column. Summarize the components of the Pediatric Assessment Triangle, PAT. Describe the hands-on assessment of the ABCs. Identify the additional assessment techniques utilized in a sample history and secondary assessment. Predict the emotional reaction an EMT may have during and after a pediatric emergency. Describe general considerations of the assessment process utilized for the pediatric patient. And list specific pathophysiology, assessment, and management of the following emergencies encountered in the pediatric patient. Respiratory distress, shock, neurological, gastrointestinal, toxicology, SIDS, and trauma. You will also be able to explain the importance of including family members in the assessment and management of a pediatric patient, explain the rationale for having knowledge and skills appropriate for dealing with a pediatric patient, attend to the feelings of the family when dealing with an ill or injured pediatric patient, and understand the provider's own response, emotional, to caring for pediatric patients. By the end of this module, you will be able to conduct a patient interview for a pediatric patient and demonstrate the assessment of a pediatric patient. The EMT needs to be aware of the differences in the pediatric patient in a variety of ways. Children are not just small adults. The illnesses and injuries found in the pre-hospital environment are highly age dependent. For example, infants are more at risk for respiratory infections because they have not yet built the immunity of older children. Infants are also at risk for dehydration and abusive injuries because they cannot tend to or defend themselves in either situation. Think of a child you may know in the toddler years. They move about quickly, have no fear of investigating new things, and tend to put anything and everything in their mouths. This behavior puts toddlers more at risk for poisonings, drowning, and electrical burns. Older school-aged children tend to be more mobile and adolescents tend to be at risk for drugs, motor vehicle crashes, and violence. How the EMT approaches each child is as individual as is a child. However, there are some general similarities and strategies that work with each age group. If an EMT is not familiar with children in each age group, it would be a great best practice to participate in activities that cover all developmental stages. The EMT must have a good understanding of how anatomic differences in each stage impact the treatments provided in the field. Adjustments in the patient interview and physical exam will also need to be made in order to successfully assess each age group. The growth and developmental stages that will be reviewed are broken down by infancy, the toddler years, preschool years, middle childhood, and finally adolescence. Each stage has unique physical development similarities, common cognitive development benchmarks, ballpark vital signs, and specific treatment considerations for providing pre-hospital care. The infant stage is considered to be from birth to one year. As short of a span this is, there are some general characteristics that need to be remembered for infant patients. Our discussion will look at developmental stages from birth to two months, two to six months, and six to twelve months. From birth to about two months, the young infant should be able to turn his or her head, gaze at an object, and perform sucking skills. The infant at this stage is completely dependent on someone else. Crying is a good sign for EMS because crying means the infant's airway is open. Crying is a form of communication for the infant. The infant will cry if hungry, angry, in pain, or uncomfortable. Crying usually will cease when the problem is addressed. However, once basic needs have been met, persistent crying can be a sign of significant illness or injury. The EMS professional should consider the cause of the crying by physical examination, observation of the environment, and thorough interviewing of the caregivers. An infant should be able to be aroused rather easily. If the EMT cannot arouse the infant, consider it a possible emergent situation. 
All small children, especially infants, have large craniums. Their heads, in proportion to their bodies, are larger than in adults. The neck muscles on small infants are not well developed, resulting in limited head control. It is important for the EMT to always support the head and neck when caring for an infant. Infants also do not have enough body fat for insulation, so it is important the EMT keep the infant warm. Since heat escapes from the head rather easily, and the infant's head is so large in proportion to the rest of the body, always attempt to keep the head covered. If clothing needs to be removed for assessment, attempt to remove and replace clothing sequentially in order to retain body heat. Always remember to warm hands and equipment before touching an infant. Once the infant starts to cry because of the shock of cold hands or a cold stethoscope, it is much harder to complete an adequate assessment. Respiratory illnesses are the most common medical problems seen in infants, and the major causes of death include sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, unintentional suffocation, and child abuse. As the infant grows physically, they are able to voluntarily smile and increase and hold more eye contact with others, especially when they begin to recognize familiar faces. They tend to use both hands to hold on to objects and start to examine things held in their hands. Some studies show that 70% of infants tend to sleep through the night by the age of 6 months. Somewhere between 2 and 6 months, caregivers begin to notice intentional rolling over by the infant. Neck muscles are increasing in strength and the infant should be able to hold his or her head up longer. This stage also includes an increased awareness of surroundings and the ability to start examining and exploring the body such as finding the toes on the end of their feet. In this age range, patient care considerations are very consistent with the birth to two month old infant. Always keep the infant warm by covering their head and removing and replacing clothes sequentially. Persistent crying or irritability can be a sign of serious illness and a lack of eye contact when sick could also be a sign of a depressed mental status or delayed development in the child. Good physical assessments and in-depth questioning of the caregiver will help determine if the mental status and eye contact is normal for the infant. Nick muscles are becoming stronger at this age but head control is still limited so protect the head and neck when lifting and moving the child. As the infant begins to recognize familiar faces, stranger anxiety also begins to develop. From 6 to 12 months, infants typically show increased mobility over time by beginning to crawl. These precious kids are now able to start sitting up without any support and they move away from grasping items with their palms to more of a pincher grasp by learning how to use their thumbs and fingers. Constant supervision is usually needed because everything a child picks up usually ends up in their mouths. At this age, the child usually begins to develop baby teeth, allowing them to start eating solid, all but soft, foods. Cognitively at this age, children are starting to babble and use their first words. First-time parents anxiously await for those first mama or dada sounds to come out of their child's mouth. Separation anxiety from parents continues to increase as a child may now protest or withdraw given a separation. In this age range, patient care considerations are again very consistent with the birth to two month old infant. Always keep the child warm by covering their head and removing and replacing clothes sequentially. Persistent crying or irritability can be a sign of serious illness or injury. Try to determine the cause. Because of increased mobility and exploration, this age range is now more at risk for foreign body airway obstructions, aspirations, or poisonings. Separation anxiety can be lessened by keeping the child and parent together during the evaluation and even letting mom or dad help out with the process. If the child is stable enough, having him or her remain in the parent's lap may help move the assessment and interventions along. However, if the child is unstable because they are seriously ill or injured, it may be necessary to keep the parents separate from the child. If possible, give the parents a job or role that allows them to help, but not be in the way of the assessment or interventions. Later in the presentation, you will learn that your assessment of a pediatric patient can begin from literally across a room. A general impression of the child can tell the trained EMT a lot, even before any vital signs are obtained. You will soon learn how to use a pediatric assessment triangle, PAT, when assessing pediatric patients. Vital signs are important to obtain, but the identification of immediate life threats will routinely be made by assessing the child's appearance, work of breathing, and circulation to the skin. Those three components comprise the PAT. Patients in this age range will typically have heart rates of 100 to 160 beats per minute depending on the child's age. The younger the child, the faster the heart beats. 
from birth to a few months after, the number of times an infant breathes is usually around 40 to 60 times per minute. As a child nears the age of one, the breathing rate slows down, yet the volume of air inspired steadily increases given larger lungs. Even though it is not recommended to measure blood pressures in the pre-hospital setting for children under the age of three, it is important to have an understanding of normal systolic numbers for all age groups. Systolic pressures begin around 70 at birth and increase to about 90 at the age of one year. Obtaining blood pressures in an infant or toddler under three is a difficult procedure to accomplish and children tend to compensate so well during a crisis. If we see drastic blood pressure changes, it is usually because a child is in grave distress. An EMT can appropriately care for an infant by assessing and reporting PAT findings along with the patient's heart and respiratory rate. Temperature during this age range tends to be from 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, measuring temperatures may be limited to children who present with a fever. Common convenient temperature monitors such as tympanic thermometers are not considered to be very reliable. Be sure to follow your local protocols regarding obtaining a temperature in an infant patient. Watch out because children in the 12 to 18 months age group tend to move like lightning, so to speak, which increases their vulnerability to and risk for injuries because they have not yet developed adequate caution in their exploration of their new environment. An EMT should be able to use words like tummy, leg, arm, eye, and head when assessing a child because by this age, children should know most of their major body parts and will be able to point to those parts when asked simple questions about owies and boo-boos. The EMT needs to be careful when asking permission to do anything to a child because their favorite word is no. It is sometimes better to give the child a choice of action, such as, should I listen to your tummy first or your back first, as opposed to absolute questions that require a yes or no answer. Providing choices gives the child a chance to participate without interrupting your assessment. There is an increased suspicion of strangers at this age, so if a child is stable, try to have the parent or caregiver hold the child, if possible, and involve them in the assessment and treatment process. As with previous age ranges, persistent crying or irritability can be a serious sign. Always look for a cause before ruling out a child's persistent crying. More teeth are now available, but the child may not be able to grind up the food adequately before swallowing due to a lack of molars, so there is a risk of food aspiration while eating. With their newfound freedom, it may be hard to keep a child still while performing an assessment. Again, utilize mom or dad in the assessment process for efficiency. Kids might think their injury or illness is a punishment for either doing or not doing something, so it is important to reassure the child on a regular basis. As with much of the population, this age range fears pain and is afraid of needles, so extra reassurance is needed during interventions, especially if they are invasive. It is important to let the child know what you are going to do, when you are going to do it, and why. Sometimes if you allow the child to bring along a favorite toy, blanket, or stuffed animal, you can distract the child and decrease his or her level of anxiety. As long as they are stable, children in this age group respond best to a torso-to-head physical exam. That gives the EMT time to build a connection with the child without becoming overbearing. Using the equipment in a way to make a game out of the assessment will help the child be more comfortable and cooperative. Examples of this technique would be blowing up a glove into a balloon and then drawing a funny face on it for the child to play with. Using the oxygen mask as a Santa beard or even having the child blow out the light like a candle on the pen light to increase tidal volume while assessing lung sounds. There are a lot of tricks you will learn or even develop while dealing with all age groups. These are just examples of a few. Physical development in the 18 to 36 month range gives a child improved gait and balance. They begin to run and climb on all available furniture and surfaces in their path, which increases their risk of injuries due to falls. They begin to have a better understanding of cause and effect. For example, if they touch the stove, it might be hot, resulting in an owie. But just as with the younger toddler range, the children might think their injury or illness is a punishment for either doing or not doing something, so it is important to reassure the child on a regular basis. The EMT should be able to obtain additional information from the child because of an increased vocabulary. Emotionally, this age group dislikes separation from their parents. As long as the child is stable, keeping the parents involved in the process will probably encourage cooperation for the child. Find out about a favorite toy or object and allow the child to hold on to it if possible. 
Just as a 12 to 18 month range, this age range fears pain and is afraid of needles, so extra reassurance is needed during interventions such as obtaining a blood glucose or an injection of medication. It still remains important to let the child know what you are going to do, when you are going to do it, and why. Sometimes, if you allow the child to bring along a favorite toy, blanket, or stuffed animal, you can distract the child and decrease the level of anxiety. As long as they are stable, children in this age group respond best to a trunk-to-head physical exam. That gives the EMT time to build a connection with the child without becoming overbearing. Remember, using the equipment in a way to make a game out of the assessment will tend to make the child more comfortable and cooperative. Typical vital signs during the toddler years are as follows. Heart rates range from 80 to 130 beats per minute. Respiratory rates range from 20 to 30 respirations per minute. Systolic blood pressures range from 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Temperatures range from 96.8 to 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. During the preschool years, three to six years old, children tend to become more mobile and active in activities and sports. This increase in activities also increases their exposure to traumatic incidents and makes the age group more vulnerable to injury. Toilet training usually occurs during the early preschool age range, although some do start as toddlers. Preschoolers have the most rapid increase in their language during this period and can answer simple questions appropriately. Thinking tends to be of the magical nature and rules tend to be absolute, so some of the fears for this age group tend to be irrational. The child might be frightened of his or her own injury, especially if it is bloody, because the child might see it as permanent. Emotionally, this age group learns acceptable and unacceptable behaviors, and preschool children tend to have tantrums when they do not get what they want. The fear of stranger danger is developing, given exposure to all the educational lessons provided by the media and parents. Modesty starts to show itself, given the dislike of being undressed by someone, and this age group commonly fears permanent injury. This age range is more trusting and friendly to strangers than toddlers, but they still have anxiety with stranger danger. The EMT should be able to elicit more information regarding the illness or injury due to the increased language capability of the patient. As with any patient, respect their modesty when performing the exam. If possible, begin the exam with the chest and abdomen, then proceed to the head and extremities. Kneel down to the child's level and allow the child to help with the exam. Appeal to the child's magical thinking. An example is to tell a child that the magic smoke from the nebulizer will help him or her feel better. Have a healthy understanding that this age group really fears pain, along with the sight of blood or injuries, so adjust your words and interventions appropriately. Let the child know what you are going to do and if it will hurt when you do so. Typical vital signs during the preschooler years are as follows. Heart rates range from 80 to 120 beats per minute. Respiratory rates range from 20 to 30 respirations per minute. Systolic blood pressures range from 80 to 110 millimeters of mercury. Temperatures range from 96.8 to 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In middle childhood, 6 to 12 years of age, physical development changes are observed with the loss of baby teeth and the eruption of permanent adult teeth. This age range is highly mobile and at a higher risk of injury. During middle childhood, kids tend to begin thinking with greater logic, so they can communicate more effectively. School and friends become an important part of life. Popularity and peer pressure affect self-consciousness and self-esteem. They still like to have a parent nearby in an emergency, but independence starts to show. They like to act grown-up, but their fears are still similar to that of a preschooler. They are afraid of blood and pain, and they still fear permanent injury or disfigurement with injuries. When responding to an emergency for a child between the ages of 6 and 12 years, try to provide simple explanations for illnesses and subsequent treatments. You may see more cooperation if you also provide a sense of control by giving the child a choice in the order of treatments if possible. As always, respect the patient's modesty and recover any exposed areas after the physical exam. Engage the child in a conversation by asking questions about school or topics familiar to them. Typical vital signs for a child in middle childhood are as follows. Heart rates range from 70 to 110 beats per minute. Respiratory rates range from 20 to 30 respirations per minute. Systolic blood pressures range from 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury. 
temperature begins to approach a normal adult temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If you are keeping track of trends, you will notice as a child increases in age, the pulse rate drops, the respiratory rate drops slightly, and the systolic blood pressure increases slightly. Body temperature slowly approaches what we consider to be normal in the adult. Adolescence is the transition period between childhood and adulthood. There are a lot of physical changes in the body, which leads to increased modesty in both genders. Breast development in females, pubic hair growth, and hormonal changes all bring about new emotional and physical concerns to the adolescent. Cognitively, the adolescent is able to communicate as an adult, and they have an increased ability to reason as they age, which can contradict some of their actions as they tend to deny that real-life tragedies, like death and accidents, may happen to them. The adolescent will also start to develop morals as they increasingly find themselves in unique positions involving peers and family. Because of physical changes, the adolescent is typically self-conscious about body image as they are forced to become more comfortable with themselves. More relationships and friendships begin with the opposite gender and adolescents start to develop a better understanding of who they are and what they believe. If the adolescent is injured, they will be concerned with their body image and what other people will think. A small cut on the adolescent's face may appear minor but can be devastating to the 16-year-old. Due to increased freedom and peer pressure during this age range, the adolescent dabbles in more self-destructive behaviors such as tobacco use, smoking, alcohol, and illicit drug use. Obtaining a driver's license opens up a whole new world of freedom to the adolescent, which is one of the reasons why motor vehicle accidents claim so many young lives. Given societal and peer pressures, eating disorders such as anorexia and bulimia are too common in the adolescent population, especially with females. People in this age group struggle with depression and thoughts of suicide more than any other age group. Adolescents want to be treated like adults, but remember they may still share many of the same fears and insecurities of the younger child. Explain all assessments and treatments clearly and honestly. Give them choices if appropriate as far as assessments and interventions are concerned. Respect their modesty by trying to have an EMT of the same gender perform the exam. If possible or needed, assess and treat the patient away from the parents to obtain a more accurate history and story. Address the patient's fears and concerns about lasting effects of their injuries, especially cosmetic concerns. Be cognizant that adolescence is a time of many hormonal surges, emotions, and peer pressure. The adolescent is at risk for substance abuse, self-endangerment, pregnancy, and dangerous sexual practices. The EMT must remain non-judgmental when providing reassuring care. Typical vital signs for an adolescent are heart rates range from 55 to 105 beats per minute, respiratory rates range from 12 to 20 respirations per minute, systolic blood pressures range from 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury, temperatures are close to a normal adult temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. These vital signs are very close to that of an average adult. At this point, we'll shift away from looking at specific pediatric age ranges and begin discussing pediatric anatomy and physiology in general. For the first several years of life, the child's head is proportionately larger relative to their body size. In simple terms, small children have large heads. Because of the weight and size of the head, there is an increased likelihood of trauma to the head of a small child. The head is heavy and tends to precede the body when falling. Think of the small child's head as being similar to an adult's while wearing a motorcycle helmet. The adult head wearing a motorcycle helmet is now proportionately similar to the child's in terms of relative size and weight to the rest of the body. Unfortunately, the pediatric head obviously lacks the protective features of the helmet though. Given their larger head, pediatric patients lying on their backs can experience airway obstructions because the size of the head causes the neck to flex forward, which can narrow or even close the child's airway. This is commonly not a concern for the adult patient where the head is proportionate to the body. With that in mind, it is important to make adjustments when opening and securing the airway of the small child. A small towel or blanket placed under the child between the shoulders will help move the airway in a more neutral position. On the same note, hyperextending the neck leads to further obstruction in infants and children as well because the tracheal rings are soft, allowing compression of the airway. There are also a lot of blood vessels in the head and it is common for patients to lose tremendous body heat through their head. This is even more pronounced in a pediatric patient where the head has a proportionally larger surface area than the body. 
Soft spots in the skull, fontanelles, are normal in the young child. This is because the newborn must pass through the mother's birth canal and a rigid skull would not provide the flexibility necessary for the birthing process. Fontanelles begin to close between the ages of 9 and 18 months. Fontanelles in younger children can provide important information to the EMT during assessments. When infants cry, their fontanelles tend to bulge out a bit, which is a normal sign. However, when the child appears to be ill and their fontanelles are bulging, it may be from increased intracranial pressure inside the skull. Inversely, if the fontanelles appear sunken, it may be an indication of dehydration in the small child. As discussed several modules ago in the overview of human body presentation, pediatric airways are smaller in diameter and shorter in length than an adult airway. Any compromise such as swelling, fluid, or trauma can be very detrimental in the pediatric patient's ability to breathe adequately, more so than in an adult patient. The jaw size is smaller, while the tongue is proportionally larger in the mouth as compared to the adult patient. This trait becomes important to remember because the tongue is generally one of the most common obstructions in the pediatric airway. Opening the airway with a jaw thrust maneuver will help position the tongue in a location to ensure optimal airway patency. Infants are obligate nose breathers, which allows them to breathe and swallow nurse at the same time. This means that they breathe through their mouths only when crying. Thus, it is extremely important to clear the nasal airway with a bulb syringe or other appropriate size suction catheter. Tracheal cartilage is also softer and more collapsible in the small child, so correct airway manipulation to a neutral position is imperative. In comparison to the adult patient, the child's epiglottis is long, floppy, and narrow, which can make it more of an obstruction when positioning the airway, especially if it is swollen. Airway care for a pediatric patient includes suctioning both the nares and the mouth. In the very small infant, suctioning the nares first stimulates the breathing, so whatever gunk is in the mouth will be inhaled down into the airway. That is the reason EMS providers, yourself included, are taught to suction and clear an infant's mouth first, then the nose. Remember to place the child's airway in a neutral position with a jaw thrust for optimal patency. Smaller airways are more easily obstructed by flexion or hyperextension, particulate matter including mucus and fluids, and soft tissue swelling. Children compensate for airway obstructions by increasing respiratory rates and effort. Multiple factors make it harder for children to compensate for airway obstructions than an adult, such as a flexible rib cage, weaker intercostal muscles, and diaphragmatic or abdominal breathing. Children in respiratory distress are considered true emergencies as respiratory muscles can fatigue rapidly, leading to respiratory failure and subsequent arrest with very little warning. When assessing the chest of a pediatric patient, some important anatomy and physiology considerations to keep in mind are the pliability of the ribs given more cartilage in the rib cage when compared to an adult, there is less overlying muscle and fat to protect the rib cage and vital organs beneath the ribs, and ribs move in more of a horizontal fashion primarily due to weaker intercostal muscles. As a result, small children are predominantly diaphragmatic breathers. They rely on the diaphragm more than the muscles of the chest wall to breathe. There are also fewer alveoli present in the lungs during the first year of life, which does not allow for much collateral ventilation in times of respiratory distress. The chest wall of the pediatric patient is also thinner than the adult, which does make it easier for an EMT to listen to lung sounds and hear heart tones. When managing the pediatric patient, it is important to ensure effective movement of the diaphragm to sustain adequate ventilation. Rib fractures are less common in the pediatric patient given a higher proportion of cartilage to bone, but any trauma to the chest can cause significant damage to underlying internal organs because the protection afforded by a flexible rib cage is less than in an adult patient with a fully developed and rigid rib cage. Lungs are fragile and prone to tissue damage, pneumothorax, or a collapsed lung. If rib fractures are present in the pediatric patient, consider the likelihood of significant energy transmission and evaluate for multi-system trauma in that patient. Picture yourself sitting in your living room watching a TV ad for a brand name diaper company. On screen you see a small toddler waddling across the screen, smiling and babbling, wearing only a form-fitting diaper. How cute is that child? The advertisers really know how to reach our senses. But back to anatomy. What you see is a small child with a protruding abdomen or belly, which is actually a normal finding in small pediatric patients. The muscles of the abdomen are less developed when they are smaller and the internal organs are more anterior in the body. 
In the abdominal cavity, the liver and spleen are proportionally larger to the rest of the organs, and the soft, pliable ribs offer less protection to the abdominal organs. When managing pediatric patients with potential illness and injuries, remember that seemingly insignificant external forces applied to the abdomen can cause serious internal multi-organ injuries. Because of their size and location, the liver, spleen, and kidneys are more frequently injured. When palpating the abdominal quadrants, it is not normal for the abdomen to be firm or rigid. There should be no pain or tenderness on palpation. Also, watch for gastric distension from air trapped in the belly and readjust your ventilation techniques if this occurs during resuscitative efforts. Remember that children rely heavily on the diaphragm for breathing. Chest rise is not as noticeable, but you will observe more diaphragmatic breathing. If you were to peel back all the muscles, tissues, and subcutaneous fat from the skeletal system, the bones you find in the pediatric patient are the same as in the adult patient. As the person transitions into adulthood, the bones, which were soft and pliable as a child, begin to harden and become stronger. Children have growth plates, or what is considered to be an area of growing tissue, near the ends of their long bones. These areas are open and allow for the bones to grow. They are also weaker than true bone, however. When the body finishes growing, the plates close and become replaced by solid bone. Injuries to the growth plates can result in bone length discrepancies. Children and young adults tend to have growth plate injuries in the long bones adjacent to the wrists, ankles, knees, or feet. Fractures and dislocations are not always evident in the field and may only be discovered with x-rays at the hospital, so it is important for EMS to treat signs and symptoms in conjunction with appreciation for the mechanism of injury. Immobilize the pediatric patient with splinting techniques similar to those used with adults, but remember to use appropriate size splinting equipment. When splinting an injury, it is important to assess the patient's circulation, pulse, movement capability, and sensory status before and after splinting a body part. In the pediatric population, another way to assess circulation status is to check capillary refill time in a nail bed distal to the injury. Our skin is the largest organ in or arguably on the body, and it can offer the EMT a lot of information about a patient's circulation and perfusion. In the pediatric patient, the skin has a larger surface area in proportion to body mass when compared to an adult. This can become an issue during the management of burn and environmental injuries. The skin layers are thinner and can be more easily, quickly, and deeply burned than adult skin. Given the larger surface area, there is a potential for greater fluid and heat loss as well. Any resulting hypothermia can then complicate any treatment and resuscitative efforts for the child. We already discussed some specific anatomical differences in the pediatric airway structures, but we also need to point out that there are some specific physiologic differences as well. In the pediatric patient, there is a high oxygen demand per kilogram of body weight, nearly double that of in adults as a matter of fact. With smaller, less developed lungs, the available oxygen reserves are a lot lower, which can increase the risk of hypoxia when a child is apneic or is receiving ineffective ventilatory support. When managing a pediatric patient requiring ventilations, make sure to choose a correct size bag valve mask based on the patient's size and use only enough force to make the chest rise slightly. Overaggressive bagging will produce gastric distension, possible vomiting, and barotrauma, including pneumothorax. Ventilations with a bag valve mask that is too small in volume will result in hypoxia and a negative outcome. Undeveloped respiratory accessory muscles are also more susceptible to early signs of fatigue, so constant monitoring of the work of breathing is necessary. As the child ages, there will be a continual increase in the number of alveoli, so lung reserves will also increase. As we now know that there is a higher relative oxygen demand for the pediatric patient than there is for the adult patient, our previous discussions regarding vital signs for each age group should make more sense. Heart rates and respiratory rates are higher in the smaller child. The demand is there, so the heart and lungs need to work harder and faster to circulate blood and deliver oxygen to all the tissues and cells. Over time, capillary beds become better developed to help in thermal regulation. Any constriction of blood vessels in the pediatric patient may have a profound effect on the circulation status. The first visible areas of decreased perfusion would be in the skin and the patient's mental status. Even though there is less blood volume circulating in the pediatric patient, there is a proportionally larger amount of blood circulating in the body when compared to an adult.
That is one reason why children in shock compensate for blood loss early on and then suddenly crash without a lot of warning. Small amounts of blood loss may have dire consequences for the pediatric patient. The child's circulatory status should be monitored carefully and often. In many instances, if you wait until the child looks like they are in shock to start treating for shock, it may be too late for that child. As with other pediatric patient body systems, the nervous system tissue is fragile and lacks the development found in adults. The brain tissue itself, as well as the vascular system, is more fragile and prone to bleeding after an injury. Since the subarachnoid space is relatively smaller, it offers less cushioning when the brain is jarred during an impact. Falls, motor vehicle accidents, and shaken baby are all mechanisms that can permanently damage brain tissue and the spinal cord given these factors. In their early years, a child's brain will reach 90% of an adult brain's size and weight. Myelination formation increases dramatically, enabling increased transmissions of nerve impulses that lead to greater cognitive and motor skills development. With all that growing and developing in the pediatric nervous system, the brain requires two times the amount of cerebral blood flow than an adult brain. Assessment of the nervous system in an infant may seem daunting, but simple assessments can yield a good understanding of the patient's general neurological status. An infant will have a sucking reflex if something is put to the mouth and will have an intact gag reflex. Acknowledgement of these reflexes is routinely accomplished by interviewing the caregiver or parents. When assessing the infant at rest, their arms and legs should naturally be in a semi-flex position. If they are flaccid or overextended, this may be an indication of a significant illness or injury to the nervous system. If the EMT introduces an outside stimulus to the infant, there should be equal movement of extremities on both sides of the body. In the pre-hospital management of the pediatric patient, oxygenation and ventilation play a large role in maintaining consistent cerebral blood flow to the brain and spinal cord. Any hypoxia or reduction of circulating volume can cause significant permanent detrimental effects on the pediatric patient. Ligament injuries are more common than actual spinal cord injuries. Therefore, management of the head with support and padding where necessary will help keep the pediatric airway open, which will have an effect on oxygenation. Glucose is a vital fuel for all age groups. It is an important source of energy for the body, and it is also stored in muscles and the liver for later use. When there are limited glucose stores in the body, infants and small children may have trouble fueling their bodies and brains with devastating results. Limited glucose stores are also very common and expected in babies born to diabetic mothers and premature babies with low birth weights. EMTs in Wisconsin are able to measure glucose levels in all age ranges, which gives us an opportunity to treat some blood sugar problems in the pre-hospital setting. Small and premature infants are more susceptible to hypothermia due to a large surface area in proportion to their limited body mass and less inherent body insulation, fat. Infants may lose heat rapidly if their clothes and diapers are wet, if they are exposed to windy conditions, or if they are submerged in cold water. Hypothermia could be a factor in both medical and traumatic situations. The EMT should be cognizant of cool rooms and ambient temperatures that can reduce an infant's body temperature. It is important to keep the infant warm during transport. Covering a patient's head will help reduce heat loss at any age, but this is especially true for a pediatric patient. Be aware, however, that overwarming a newborn too much can worsen neurological outcomes as well. Now that we have reviewed some major differences in anatomy and physiology between pediatric and adult patients, it is time to discuss the pediatric assessment process. It is common for pediatric emergencies to cause increased stress levels in the EMT because it is more difficult to assess smaller patients who cannot tell us what is bothering them or what hurts. Communication is often an obstacle given the child's level of cognitive development and understanding. Most EMS providers do not routinely see a lot of pediatric patients, which also increases stress given a lack of familiarity and comfort with pediatric patients. There are substantial differences in anatomy, physiology, cognitive development, and understanding between newborns, adolescents, and all age groups in between. Assessment strategies will need to be modified for each age group as a result. The utilization of different communication techniques aside, the EMT's initial goal in assessing a pediatric patient is to determine whether the child fits into the sick, critical, or not sick, stable category. 
Classifying a child as sick or not sick will help the assessment and intervention stay on the proper course. It can be important to utilize a parent or caregiver when assessing children, especially if they are younger. Parents and caregivers can provide important information about the child's medical history, signs, possible symptoms, and the events leading up to the emergency. Parents and caregivers can assist in calming a child to increase his or her cooperativeness. With that being said, parents can sometimes become part of the problem, not the solution. Agitated parents can agitate a child, while calm parents typically tend to relax a child. Caregivers and parents can also help the EMT understand what is normal activity and presentation for the child. Children can change quickly. It is important to continually assess and reassess interventions and treatments on a regular basis. The five areas we will review in greater detail pertaining to conducting a pediatric assessment include preparation, scene size up, patient assessment, including the pediatric assessment triangle, the hands-on approach to airway, breathing, and circulation management, and all other assessments while continuing care. When comparing the adult assessment to the pediatric assessment process, you will note some modifications and variations in order, flow, and terminology. These occur in order to complete the pediatric assessment process in the safest, most efficient manner possible for the patient. As mentioned earlier, most EMS professionals do not see a large pediatric emergency call volume. Part of our professional responsibilities in ongoing development is to have an in-depth understanding of this population's characteristics, physical attributes, and cognitive development. There are many resources an EMT can utilize to prepare for pediatric encounters. Visiting, volunteering, or working at daycare facilities and schools, babysitting neighbors, nieces, and nephews, or spending time with the boy or girl scouts are all excellent ways to prepare you for your next pediatric patient. Ambulance services in Wisconsin are required to carry specialized pediatric equipment that should be reviewed on a regular basis. Be sure to practice using the equipment as well. Regular review of normal age-appropriate vital signs and presentations should be part of your continuing education. Many hospitals and service providers offer in-services and conferences specifically geared to the pediatric population. Safety for the EMT, the crew, the patient, and bystanders will always be the number one priority during any assessment. Make sure to review the session on scene size up presented in the patient assessment module for a complete review of the steps and components of an adequate scene size up, including body substance isolation, personal protective equipment, determining the mechanism of injury or nature of illness, determining the number of patients, and calling for additional resources. Some additional items or clues from the scene that become important in the pediatric scene size up include evaluating the scene for alcohol or drug use, either from the patient or bystanders, noting the position and location in which the patient was found, observing and noting the parents or caregivers interactions with the child, and whether or not there appears to be any child abuse or neglect given injuries are inconsistent with the history provided. Are the parents or caregivers appropriately concerned with the injury or illness? Do the parents show anger or act indifferent? Can the child be comforted and calmed by the parents or caregivers, or does the child display fearfulness or withdrawing tendencies? Those behaviors may all be indications of potential abuse. The Pediatric Assessment Triangle, PAT, provides an effective 15 to 30 second tool for the rapid assessment of the severity of the pediatric patient's illness or injury and the need for life-saving interventions. It is usually done as the EMT enters the scene and approaches the patient. In many services, this is called an across-the-room assessment. There is no touching necessary, only looking and listening. It is done even before the hands-on ABCs of the primary assessment. The three components of the PAT are appearance, work of breathing, and circulation to the skin. When assessing the appearance of the child, it may be helpful to remember the mnemonic tickles for tone, interactiveness, consolability, look, gaze, and speech, cry. Look at the muscle tone of the child. Does the child appear normal versus limp, listless, or flaccid? In the distressed child, muscle tone reflects the energy reserves available. The child who is struggling to breathe will be working hard with increased muscle tone until he or she simply tires out from the effort. As the child tires, muscle tone decreases. By the time full arrest is imminent, the child may appear relaxed and limp, which should be considered an ominous sign. Observe the interactiveness of the child. Is the child alert, agitated, or lethargic? 
With the EMS crew on the scene, the environment should be somewhat exciting for the child. A lethargic child, given the flurry of activity associated with the emergent circumstance, can be a bad sign. Can the parents or caregivers console the child? Watch the child's eye contact and follow his or her gaze. Can the child fixate on and follow an object with his or her eyes? Or does the child have a glassy-eyed stare? Lastly, listen when the child speaks or cries. Is the cry or communication clear, strong, weak, muffled, or hoarse? Appearance can be one of the most reliable signs when assessing the pediatric patient because infants and children who are physiologically unstable or critical look sick. The second side of the PAT is to evaluate the work of breathing. Without a stethoscope, listen for abnormal breath or airway sounds such as strider, grunting, wheezing, or crowing. Observe the child for abnormal body positioning like the tripod position or a refusal to lie down. Watch for sternal and or intercostal retractions in the neck and chest wall. Nasal flaring is a normal physiologic response to hypoxia because it leads to the lowering of resistance in the airways. Keep an eye out for that as well. The third side of the PAT focuses on circulation to the skin. Remember that the skin is the largest organ in the human body and it can show a great deal about how a patient is perfusing. Assess for pallor, mottling, or cyanosis. These are all indicative of an ill child. Any abnormalities or problems identified in the first 30 seconds of the pediatric assessment triangle can be from respiratory distress or failure, cardiovascular shock, cardiopulmonary failure or arrest, isolated head injuries, ingestion of poisoning, or other central nervous system issues, all of which are significant emergencies that require rapid and aggressive intervention in the pre-hospital setting. The EMT should be able to begin initial triage and make a transport decision based on assessment of the three components within the pediatric assessment triangle. The pediatric patient should be categorized as urgent, sick, or stable, not sick. The urgent patient should receive a rapid ABC assessment, treatment, and transport. If the patient is labeled as stable, proceed with the ABC assessment followed by the focused history and complete physical exam. Begin transport and start potential therapies en route to the receiving facility. The hands-on ABC assessment step is completed immediately after the 30-second PAT assessment. Make sure the airway is open and will stay open by talking to your patient. If the patient is unable to maintain his or her own airway, perform a jaw thrust or chin lift to move the airway into a neutral position. Consider suctioning with a bulb syringe or suction catheter if secretions are present. If airway adjuncts are needed, choose either a nasal or oral adjunct based on the patient's presentation. Assessing breathing and oxygenation requires the EMT to evaluate respiratory rate and effort, auscultate lung sounds with the stethoscope, and listen for normal or abnormal sounds. If the EMT has the equipment, he or she should measure oxygenation with a pulse oximeter and consider applying oxygen if necessary using a nasal cannula for a low flow and lower concentration or a non-rebreather mask for a high flow and higher concentration of oxygen. If the patient needs assistance with breathing, choose the appropriate size bag valve mask. Both the masks and the bags are produced and marketed in different sizes. The child may resist wearing an oxygen mask, so consider blow-by techniques if necessary. Assessment of the patient's circulation includes checking the heart rate, both centrally and peripherally. Pulse rates, pulse quality, and pulse regularity should be assessed. Assessing circulation to the skin includes checking a general temperature to determine if it is cool, warm, or normal, and feeling the condition of the skin to determine if it is dry, clammy, or diaphoretic. Finally, look at the general color of the skin to determine if it is normal, pale, flushed, or looks otherwise abnormal. Capillary refill time, CRT, is commonly used in the younger patient to determine adequacy of perfusion. As you are assessing the skin, do not forget to look for any uncontrolled active bleeding. The last part of the circulation assessment would be to obtain a blood pressure if the child is over the age of 3. Assessment of the child's neurological disability, if any, includes measuring the level of consciousness by either using the AVPU AVPU scale or a modified version of it for the infant and small patient. If the small child is acting age appropriate, you should consider the child to be alert. Disability assessments require you to check the pupils for equal and appropriate reaction to light and to test for any neurological motor deficits by having the patient move all extremities. 
The last part of the disability assessment is to check for pain using a standardized pain scale. In adult patients, the standardized pain scale usually uses the 0 to 10 scale, where 0 is no pain and 10 is the worst pain. The pain scale will need to be modified for the pediatric patient in most instances. Some services actually use little cards with drawings of faces on them showing different levels of pain distress to which a child can point. Check with your local protocols for pediatric pain scales. The last segment of the hands-on ABC assessment is exposure. The EMT should remove areas of clothing as necessary and examine for additional injuries and abnormalities. Remember that heat loss is a major concern with the pediatric patient, so promptly recover to prevent hypothermic states. After completing the hands-on ABC assessment for the pediatric patient, you should have an idea as to what facility would be the most appropriate transport destination. The next assessments may take place on scene if there is no transport urgency or while en route to the receiving facility. The order of these assessments may be different than that presented based on patient presentation and available resources. The sample history will help the EMT determine the signs and symptoms from which the patient is suffering. Allergies to food, environmental, or medicines are important to determine. Ask whether the patient is currently taking any prescribed medications and, if so, what the medications are. If you are unfamiliar with a particular medication, look it up or ask why the patient is taking the medication. Ask about over-the-counter and prescribed medications as well as herbal supplements. The older your pediatric patient, the more important it is to ask about illicit drug and alcohol use. It may be necessary to separate the pediatric patient from his or her parents to increase the likelihood of an honest, affirmative answer. The patient's past medical history may yield needed clues in the assessment. Investigate any past pertinent medical problems by asking follow-up questions and also explore any key events that precipitated the current illness or injury. Every patient needs some type of physical exam. The EMT should look at the mechanism of injury and or nature of illness, the PAT, and the ABCs to determine if a head-to-toe or a focused physical exam is necessary. If a secondary assessment is performed to the head, look for any bruising or swelling and examine the quality of the fontanelles in the small infant. Look in the nose for drainage or anything that has the ability to obstruct breathing through the nose. Suction any secretions with bulb syringe or suction catheter. Look in the ears for any drainage of blood and check the mouth for loose teeth, identifiable odors, or bleeding. When assessing the neck of a pediatric patient, check for abnormal bruising or swelling. If the patient has a fever, also determine whether or not the patient is able to move the head by bending and turning the neck. An assessment of the torso includes both the anterior chest and the posterior back. Look for bruises, injuries, or rashes. In the abdomen, assess for distension, tenderness, seatbelt abrasions, or bruising. The extremities should be checked for deformity, swelling, or pain on movement. In critical patients, a head-to-toe order is suggested. If the child is stable, the EMT might choose a toes-to-head assessment based on the child's chief complaint. In young, stable children, it may be best to begin the secondary assessment at the torso, proceeding to the extremities, concluding with the head. This approach helps alleviate anxiety for the young pediatric patient. In the event of a specific non-life-threatening injury to a particular area of the body, a focused physical examination is also warranted. Such an assessment commonly looks for deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. During transport, reassessment of vital signs, the PAT, and ABCs should be completed at appropriate intervals. All interventions should also be rechecked. If the patient is critical, reassessment should be done every 5 minutes. If the patient is stable, reassessment may be performed every 15 minutes. Respiratory distress is the most common medical problem in infants and young children. In pediatric children, cardiac arrest is usually preceded and caused by respiratory arrest. Pediatric patients are predisposed to airway obstructions and respiratory distress for multiple reasons. We have already discussed the anatomic and physiologic differences in pediatric versus adult airways, so it should not be surprising that the small pediatric airway is easily obstructed by foreign bodies, fluid, or swelling. Any respiratory illness affecting the lower airway has a much more pronounced effect on younger children as well. Additionally, other non-respiratory conditions or medical emergencies may be life-threatening because of their effect on the airway and breathing. Some of those other conditions include seizures, head injuries, and any state 
of altered mental status. All of these may result in the obstruction of the pediatric airway because the tongue can fall back to the posterior and obstruct airflow. Over the next few slides, we will review several medical emergencies that also affect the patency of the pediatric airway. Before we do that, however, it is important for the EMT to recognize the various signs and symptoms associated with respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and respiratory arrest. Respiratory distress is a sliding scale and the EMT must determine what specific interventions are needed depending on where the patient is within that range. In early stages of respiratory distress, the patient is still alert and can talk. The patient may exhibit slight changes in his or her mental status such as anxiousness and restlessness. At this point, the body recognizes there is some distress and hypoxia, so the body starts to compensate by trying to increase the amount of air, and thus oxygen, being exchanged in the lungs. Respiratory rates and heart rates will increase, and abnormal sounds resembling wheezing, grunting, or crackling may be heard. The patient is usually sitting in a tripod position and speaking in short sentences or word strings. Nasal flaring might be present in the infant or young child. An increase in accessory muscle use along with retractions may be visible. In the respiratory distress stage, there is still a lot of fight left in the patient, so to speak. Management of the respiratory distress patient varies depending on the cause of distress, but oxygen administration via a nasal cannula, a non-rebreather mask, or blow-by oxygen is commonly warranted to treat the patient's developing hypoxia. Administration of medications may also be an option depending on the cause of the distress and whether or not the warranted medication falls within the EMS provider's scope of practice. As the patient moves into respiratory failure, the body starts to experience fatigue and the child's efforts to breathe start to wane. Cyanosis might develop in nail beds and around the patient's lips, changing the color of those areas to resemble a bluish tint. Changes in behavior are evident and the patient may become increasingly agitated before they slip into an altered mental state. At this point, the heart is also starved for oxygen and the patient's pulse rate decreases to a very ominous bradycardia. These patients may still have some energy reserve left, but they are clearly headed down the tubes and need immediate aggressive intervention by the EMT. This state is dangerous because these patients may go from the unstable respiratory failure state to the critical respiratory arrest stage without warning. Respiratory arrest occurs when breathing stops. Immediate positive pressure ventilations with a bag valve mask and high flow oxygen is required. Respiratory arrest can stem from a progression of a medical condition, a foreign body obstruction, or a traumatic event. Depending on the nature of illness or injury, this may be a gradual or a sudden process. Regardless, the pediatric patient in respiratory arrest will die if aggressive interventions are not started immediately. One of the most common causes of respiratory problems in pediatric patients is an airway obstruction. In discussing airway obstructions, it is common to identify which part of the airway is primarily affected. Thus, airway obstructions are commonly denoted as being either upper or lower airway obstructions. Common upper airway obstructions include croup, foreign body aspiration, bacterial tracheitis, epiglottitis, and tracheostomy dysfunction. General lower airway obstructions commonly caused by reactive diseases include asthma, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, foreign bodies, and pertussis. While many of these pathologies impact adults as well, we will take a little time to discuss these obstructions as they specifically impact pediatric patients. Croup is a viral infection that results in swelling and inflammation of the lining in the upper airway structure. It occurs more commonly in the winter months. Signs and symptoms vary by the type of infection, but they are generally more evident either at night when the child is sleeping or when the child is upset or crying. One distinct sign that makes croup easier to identify from other respiratory difficulties is the loud cough that sounds like a seal bark. Other signs and symptoms may include grunting, wheezing, strider, cold-like symptoms, pale, cyanotic, retractions, or nasal flaring. Grunting is commonly heard at the end of respiration. It is a later sign produced by the body's efforts to open blocked airways. Wheezing is a high-pitched whistling sound created by the narrowing of the airway structure and is heard predominantly during expiration because air becomes trapped. Inspiratory sounds usually suggest a foreign body or other cause of obstruction in the trachea or upper airway, 
but a child with croup may have both inspiratory and expiratory wheezing associated with their illness. Strider is a sign of an upper airway obstruction. It is heard on inspiration due to swelling or obstruction around the vocal cords. Aside from foreign body aspiration, congenital airway abnormalities such as an extremely large tongue or developed airway abnormalities such as a cyst or tumor could also result in strider. It can also be heard with infections such as croup, upper airway edema, or trauma. Based on how hypoxic the child is, skin color changes such as pallor or cyanosis may be visible. Intercostal retractions are easy to identify in the pediatric patient having respiratory distress. Retractions are the visible sinking in of the soft tissues of the chest between and around the firmer tissues of the bones and cartilage of the ribs. Finally, nasal flaring is the voluntary reaction of the body attempting to keep airway passages open. Patient management includes monitoring the ABCs and administering oxygen through a nasal cannula, non-rebreather mask, or by utilizing a blow-by technique. Make sure the patient is in a position of comfort and transport. Depending on the patient's level of respiratory difficulty, you may want to consider calling for an ALS intercept if available. As we learned earlier, young children tend to put almost anything into their mouths. They are naturally curious and do not understand the potential negative consequences of their actions. A foreign body can lodge in any part of the airway structure, causing either a partial or a complete obstruction. With a partial airway obstruction, the patient is still able to ventilate and exchange air into and out of the lungs. If the foreign body partially obstructs the airway, monitor the ABCs closely and encourage the patient to cough. Do not intervene with back slaps or abdominal thrusts. At this point, the child is still exchanging air and receiving oxygen. External interventions could shift the foreign body, resulting in a complete obstruction. It is best for the patient to clear their own airway in those instances. If the airway is completely obstructed, however, interventions are required. Be sure to follow the current American Heart Association guidelines for the management of foreign body airway obstructions. Bacterial tracheitis is an infection of the trachea that inflames the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. It presents similar to the croup, but does not respond to conventional therapy used for a viral croup patient. Signs and symptoms observed in bacterial tracheitis include a deep cough, similar to that caused by croup difficulty breathing, high fever, and strider. Management is the same as with a croup patient. Monitor the ABCs and administer oxygen through a nasal cannula, non-rebreather mask, or by utilizing a blow-by technique. Make sure the patient is in a position of comfort and transport. Depending on the level of respiratory distress, consider an ALS intercept. The patient suffering from epiglottitis may resemble one suffering from croup, but epiglottitis is a true emergency with devastating effects if not treated immediately. Epiglottitis is caused by a bacterial infection of the epiglottis. When the epiglottis becomes infected, it inflames and swells, closing off the air passage down to the lungs. In the past, it was somewhat common to see epiglottitis in children. With current vaccinations, however, these cases are now considered to be rare. In fact, in some areas, epiglottitis is actually observed with more frequency in the adult population. A patient with epiglottitis will commonly experience a rapid onset of signs and symptoms. By comparison, croup patients tend to have cold-like symptoms for a few days before it starts to become worse. Epiglottitis patients have a sudden onset of high fever and a sore throat that makes it difficult to swallow, which in turn usually causes excessive drooling. Strider is heard due to the swelling and narrowing of the airway. The patient experiences hoarseness from the swelling and may experience chills and cyanosis due to the low levels of oxygen in the bloodstream. The patient may appear to sit very still, but the muscles of breathing are working hard. When managing this patient, be reassuring with gentle and calm actions. The EMT should not introduce any agitating stimuli to the patient. Do not suction, examine, or place anything in the mouth or pharynx. This patient warrants a rapid transport with consideration of ALS. EMS providers are exposed to many patients with special needs. More information on that special population of patients is discussed in a different module. Many of these special needs patients include patients with a tracheostomy tube for breathing. Any type of dysfunction with the tube or area surrounding the tube will cause respiratory distress in the patient. These dysfunctions may include foreign body obstructions, bleeding in or around the tube, 
air leaking around the tube, infection, or a dislodged tube. Management of the patient with a tracheostomy tube starts the same as with all other respiratory distress patients by checking the ABCs. Your first job is to maintain an open airway. That may include suctioning the proximal end of the tube, repositioning the patient, or assisting the patient with steps to clean and clear the tube. Additional treatment and interventions may be performed at the hospital. Some lower airway or reactive airway diseases we will be discussing momentarily include asthma, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, foreign body airway obstructions, pertussis, whooping cough, and cystic fibrosis. While there are many more diseases that can negatively impact a patient's respiratory status, these are some of the more common diseases you will experience as an EMS provider. With that being said, it is important for you to continue your learning beyond this initial course offering to acquire even greater familiarity with these and other diseases that impact a patient's respiratory health. Asthma is a lower reactive airway disease, RAD, that occurs in acute episodes after being triggered by an exposure to an irritant or other stimulant such as cold air, dust, strong fumes, exercise, inhaled irritants, emotional upsets, or smoke. Acute asthma episodes involve inflammation and swelling of the airway passage, spasms and tightening of the muscles surrounding the bronchi and bronchioles, and extra production of mucus, all of which make it increasingly difficult for the patient to breathe. Signs and symptoms of an acute asthma episode will vary by patient and his or her sensitivity to the irritant or stimulus. Due to the inflammation, swelling, and bronchoconstriction of the airway passages, wheezing lung sounds are a common sign in the asthma patient. Wheezing can be heard on inspiration and expiration. Due to the passive nature of exhalation, air tends to be trapped in narrowed passageways, causing wheezing to be more distinct on exhalation. Because the muscles surrounding the airways are constricting and in a state of spasm, the patient may also experience some chest tightness and shortness of breath, which creates additional anxiety. The patient may only be able to talk in short sentences or short word strings and probably will be sitting in a tripod position with pursed lip breathing. The patient may also become fatigued because of all the extra work the accessory muscles are doing to move air in or out. If the airway tighten or swell too much, the EMT may hear what is defined as a silent chest. The patient may be conscious in trying to talk, but there is not enough air movement to create any sounds in the lungs. This is a true emergency and needs immediate intervention. Patient management for an acute asthma patient includes monitoring the ABCs, administering oxygen, placing in position of comfort, administering respiratory medication based on local protocol, and rapid transport. ALS units do have the ability to provide even more interventions for an asthmatic patient. If available, the EMT may want to consider calling for ALS. Bronchiolitis is a viral illness that typically occurs in newborns and toddlers. It is often caused by the respiratory succinctal virus, RSV, which causes inflammation of the bronchioles. Bronchiolitis is more common in the winter months and early spring. Signs and symptoms of bronchiolitis may include shortness of breath, a runny, stuffy nose, wheezing, and a slight fever. Depending on the level of distress, you may also notice nasal flaring, accessory muscle use, some cyanosis, and lethargy in the patient. Management includes monitoring the ABCs, administering humidified oxygen if possible, and transporting. As with other respiratory emergencies, the EMT may also want to consider ALS assistance. Pneumonia is a lower airway disease that results from an inflammation of the lungs caused by either a bacteria or a viral infection. Pneumonia is usually triggered by a simple upper respiratory tract infection or by the flu. It commonly presents with a fever, cough, and an excess production of sputum. Excess fluid accumulation will eventually separate alveoli from the surrounding capillary beds, thus inhibiting gas exchange and causing some respiratory distress. As with many of these lower respiratory diseases, signs and symptoms for the pediatric patient exhibiting pneumonia can vary from patient to patient. Some of the more common signs and symptoms include dyspnea, difficulty breathing, abnormal breath sounds from the excessive fluid production, increased respiratory and heart rates, a low-grade fever, the chills, pale or cyanotic skin, coughing up sputum, and general malaise or fatigue.
In the more advanced stages of pneumonia, the patient may exhibit an altered level of consciousness. Patient management includes monitoring the ABCs, administering oxygen, suctioning mucus if necessary, and transport with the consideration of an ALS intercept. Pertussis is a communicable airborne bacterial infection that affects mostly infants and young children. It is highly contagious through droplet transmission. The irritating spastic cough becomes increasingly worse over a few weeks and is usually followed by a whooping sound on inspiration. It is recommended EMTs are vaccinated with DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus to protect themselves from being infected as well. Be sure to review the management of communicable diseases for specific treatments and interventions. As a reminder, good hand washing and routine cleaning of the ambulance and your equipment should always be part of the EMT's regular roles and responsibilities. Some common signs and symptoms of whooping cough are shortness of breath, a whoop sound on inspiration, cold-like symptoms including a running nose and sneezing, a long-lasting irritating coughing attack, changes in skin color and tone, loss of appetite, dehydration, and thick secretions. The patient may also vomit. To manage this highly contagious patient, monitor the ABCs, administer oxygen by non-rebreather mask to help contain the air particulates, wear appropriate personal protective equipment based on your local protocols, and transport. Make sure to follow your local guidelines on transport considerations. Some receiving facilities have special negative pressure rooms for patients with potentially communicable diseases. Cystic fibrosis is a chronic genetic disorder caused by a defective gene that leads to dysfunctions in the endocrine system. It primarily affects the respiratory and digestive systems. Excessive secretions in the lungs can cause shortness of breath and provide a breeding ground for infections. CF is a fatal disease where few patients live beyond their teens. The patient may present with a persistent productive cough, wheezing, and thick salty secretions. Management of this patient includes monitoring the ABCs, administering oxygen, suction if needed, monitor for dehydration, and transport. Depending on the patient's level of discomfort, the EMT may want to consider calling for ALS interventions. When dealing with a pediatric patient in shock, it is important to remember the anatomic and physiological differences between the different age ranges. Shock is progressive and is divided into three stages, compensated, decompensated, and irreversible. Please review the module on shock for further information covering stages, signs and symptoms, assessment parameters, management, and treatments for shock patients in every age range. Causes of an altered mental status in children can be numerous. Some of the more specific conditions we will be reviewing for the pediatric patient include meningitis, seizures, and closed head injuries. One of the mnemonics that should be considered during the assessment of any altered patient is AEIOU TIPS. This mnemonic, which we will discuss momentarily, lists numerous causes of an altered mental status. Additional information about the AEIOU TIPS mnemonic is also available in both the medical and trauma modules of this course. The A in AEIOU TIPS is for alcohol, apnea, arrhythmia, or anaphylaxis. Alcohol is a depressant that replaces sugar in the brain, resulting in an altered mental status. Apnea, not breathing, or being hypoxic can impact a child's level of response, as can a cardiac arrhythmia. Anaphylaxis is an exaggerated immune response that impacts multiple body systems, including the neurological system. E is for epilepsy, or environmental factors. While epilepsy is responsible for causing seizures, any seizure activity, if not due to epilepsy, will cause central nervous system dysfunction. Environmental conditions can alter a person's thermal regulatory functions, and too high or too low of a body temperature can affect a person's responsiveness. I is for insulin, referring to diabetes. If an individual does not have enough sugar in the blood, hypoglycemia, or too much sugar, hyperglycemia, unresponsiveness or a depressed responsiveness are possible. O is for overdose. This can include both prescribed medications as well as non-prescribed medications, such as those belonging to the child's mom or dad, and street drugs. Drugs can impact the body's sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, as well as impact other body systems that may eventually impact a child's mental status. 
Such overdoses, which can also include taking medication not prescribed to the child, can be accidental or intentional. U is for uremia, which refers to an electrolyte, hormone, fluid, or other metabolic imbalance in the body. Whenever there is such a metabolic imbalance in the body, mentation can be affected. Renal patients, any degenerative disease of the brain can affect the metabolic state of the body, resulting in an altered mental status. T is for toxins or trauma. Toxins can be injected, ingested, absorbed, or inhaled. While the signs and symptoms vary depending on the chemical compounds involved, an altered level of consciousness tends to be a common denominator. Trauma from head injuries often cause direct or indirect injuries to the brain, which affects mentation. I is for infection. The body can experience sepsis from an overwhelming infection of bacteria in the bloodstream. Cellular deficit caused by toxin inhibits the ability of the cell to utilize oxygen in the body for fuel. Meningitis is a common ailment in children and teens that can impact their neurological status. P is for psychological disorders and poisoning. Poisoning can include an overdose or toxic exposure as defined previously. A psychological disorder could cause an altered state, but the EMT should always look for another possible underlying cause of the altered mental status. S is for shock or stroke. Shock is the inability of the body to perfuse, to provide oxygen to the cells. If that hypoxia impacts the brain, an altered level of consciousness will result. While strokes are commonly associated with the elderly, this topic can also refer to increased pressure, a clot, or a bleed in the brain, which can occur due to trauma, infection, or congenital problems. Such occurrences will impact the supply of oxygen to the brain, resulting in an altered mental state. The brain and spinal cord are protected by three layers of tissue known as the meninges. Meningitis is the inflammation or infection of those layers. Meningitis can be caused by a bacteria or a virus. Viral meningitis is rarely life-threatening, whereas bacterial meningitis is often fatal. There is no possible way to know what type of meningitis a patient may have in the field, so EMS providers need to be cautious and vigilantly use standardized respiratory precautions during assessment and treatment. Signs and symptoms vary based on the type of infection and the child's age. Some common signs and symptoms include fever, poor feedings, lethargy, neck stiffness or pain, irritability, headaches, and possible bulging fontanelles in the infant. To manage this potentially contagious patient, monitor the ABCs, administer oxygen by non-rebreather mask to help contain the air particulates, wear appropriate personal protective equipment based on your local protocols, and transport. Be sure to follow your local guidelines on transport considerations given a communicable disease. Some receiving facilities have special negative pressure rooms for patients with potentially communicable diseases such as meningitis. A seizure is a sudden, brief disruption of normal functioning in the brain. Seizures are caused by abnormal electrical discharges within the brain. Some nerve cells fire without stopping and those disruptions can spread to or involve other nerve cells. Seizure activity commonly creates a surge of energy through the brain, resulting in altered levels of consciousness and the involuntary contraction of skeletal muscles. Signs and symptoms of a seizure vary given the type of seizure the patient is experiencing. Such signs and symptoms can include staring, falling, repetitive motions, disorientation, convulsions, and involuntary unorganized movements. Seizures are grouped into three areas generalized seizures, partial seizures, or status epilepticus. There are four types of generalized seizures, tonic-colonic, absence, atonic, and myocolonic. Tonic-colonic seizures are what used to be known as grand mal seizures. They are the most commonly known and recognized of all seizure activity, in which there is stiffening of the limbs, the tonic phase, followed by jerking of the limbs and or face, the colonic phase. Absence seizures were formerly known as petit mal seizures. These are short lapses of awareness during which the patient sometimes appears to be staring. These seizures begin abruptly, only last a few seconds, and end just as abruptly. There is typically no warning or after effect from an absence seizure. The patient's ability to communicate and interact with his or her surroundings usually returns quickly. Absence seizures are more common in children than adults. 
Atonic seizures, also referred to as drop attacks, result in an abrupt loss of muscle tone. The patient's head may suddenly drop. They may have a loss of posture or sudden full body collapse. This also is abrupt without warning and can lead to traumatic injuries, especially to the head and face. As in absence seizures, the patient's ability to communicate and interact with his or her surroundings returns quickly. Myocolonic seizures are defined as rapid, brief muscle contractions that usually occur at the same time on both sides of the body. Occasionally, the person will move one arm or leg at a time. Witnesses usually think of these actions as a sudden jerk or clumsiness. Partial seizures are categorized as either simple partial or complex partial. These seizures are actually the most common type of seizure. The electrical disturbance of the brain is limited to specific areas, which may eventually spread to cause a generalized seizure. Virtually any symptom can occur with a partial seizure. The difference between the two partial seizures is the patient's mental status during the seizure. Consciousness is usually retained during a simple partial seizure, where a complex partial seizure results in impaired or lost consciousness. If seizures are prolonged or occur in a series, there is an increased risk of status epilepticus, which is a continuous state of seizure activity. This type of seizure can be potentially life-threatening, especially in children. Utilization of pre-hospital ALS, if available, is important to administer medications that can stop the seizure activity. Some key points to remember during assessment and treatment of a patient exhibiting the signs and symptoms of a seizure include protecting the patient by moving furniture or other objects that would harm the patient, placing a small pad under the patient's head, and not forcibly restraining the person from having a seizure. Also, do not try to insert anything into the patient's mouth. The wives' tell that someone having a seizure will swallow their tongue is a fallacy. As you should now already realize, the tongue is attached to other structures in the head. It cannot be swallowed. Trying to insert a bite stick or some other object into the seizing person's mouth can actually make things worse by introducing facial and mouth trauma, potentially introducing a foreign body that can be swallowed or inhaled, or by placing the rescuer in harm's way while trying to open the seizing person's mouth. If possible, try to gather information from witnesses to determine when and how the episode began, how long it lasted, and what they observed. If a patient has a seizure while eating, it could lead to aspiration of the food or an airway obstruction. It is also common for the patient to experience incontinence during a seizure. Make sure to protect the dignity of the patient as you are assessing and treating him or her. Airway management should be a priority during your care. Suction if needed and think about oxygenation. Try to determine the cause of the seizure if you can. Go through the AEIOU TIPS mnemonic to rule in or rule out possibilities. Always measure a blood sugar for seizure patients. Watching a seizure can be a terrifying event for bystanders and witnesses, so be sure to calmly reassure the patient, the family, and any witnesses to the event. After some seizures, the patient may be in what is called a postictal state. This is a state where the patient may be conscious, but with a lethargic and or confused mentation. The recovery time may only be a few minutes, or it might last up to an hour. If the patient has any drugs or alcohol in his or her system, it may take longer to become fully alert and oriented. Most seizures resolve safely and do not result in death or serious injury. Just be aware that suffocation could occur if the seizure is during sleep. Generalized tonic-colonic seizures can place a substantial strain on the cardiovascular system, but this is less of a concern for the pediatric population, which typically has a more robust cardiovascular system than an adult. There are a number of things that can cause the sudden, brief disruption of normal functioning in the brain. Refer back to your AEIOU tips. Of increased significance is trauma to the brain. Anytime there is trauma, scarring may occur, which can cause a patient to seize. Sometimes a first seizure is a precursor to the discovery of a brain tumor. Medical conditions and medications can cause seizures. Infections in the body will change the chemical makeup in the systems and, if there is an infection that impacts the brain, a seizure is possible. Seizures can also be caused by drugs and alcohol. Common pediatric seizures are febrile seizures that occur when the child's body temperature rises too quickly, typically due to infection or some other illness. If no cause is determined for a seizure, it is labeled as an idiopathic seizure. 
We already discussed the anatomic and physiologic differences between the pediatric and adult gastrointestinal systems. Aside from a greater likelihood of traumatic injury to abdominal organs, of special concern for the EMS provider is pediatric vomiting and diarrhea. This is a concern because pediatric patients dehydrate quicker than their adult counterparts. Children with vomiting and diarrhea lose a lot of fluid and, along with those fluids, essential electrolytes. Because the child is probably ill, resulting in the vomiting or diarrhea, the last thing he or she wants to do is drink fluids to replace those being lost. An additional concern with vomiting is aspiration if the child also has a decreased mental status. When assessing gastrointestinal problems, it is important to find out how often and how much the child is eating or drinking. Is the child still producing wet diapers? If not, it may be indicative of dehydration. What color and consistency are the child's stools? Be sure to examine the abdomen. Look at it for signs of bruising or trauma. Palpate for tenderness or guarding. If the child has pain and is old enough to communicate effectively, ask him or her the same questions you would ask an adult. Do they have pain? Does it radiate? How would they describe it? Is it sharp, dull, localized, diffuse, or otherwise? When did the problem start? Does anything make it better or worse? If vomiting, when did it start? Is there anything unusual about it, such as projectile vomiting? Depending on the nature of the gastrointestinal complaint, there may not be much for EMS to do but transport in a position of comfort. If dehydration is a concern, the child continues to vomit, or the child appears to be in significant distress for what should be a simple bout of abdominal discomfort, consider ALS intervention to start fluid therapy or have an antiemetic administered. Anatomic and physiologic differences play an important role when discussing pediatric toxicology pathophysiology. The patient's weight and age commonly play a part in determining the effect of the substances taken and the type of interventions required. Unfortunately, poisoning can be very common in children. Luckily, fatalities are less frequent since the introduction of childproof medication packaging. Infants and toddlers put almost anything into their mouths, and they are also inherently curious. The medicine cabinet, grandma's purse, the shelf in the basement or garage, the cabinet under the sink, and other areas where medications are stored by adults are all readily accessible to the average infant or toddler. Teens and adolescents are at an increased risk for attempted suicides due to pressure, stress, and hormone changes associated with their age range in conjunction with a lack of life experience and maturity. If possible, try to identify the substances to aid in treatment of the patient. Try to bring containers with you to the hospital if possible. Depending on the substance, the patient's mental status may change rapidly from alert and responsive to comatose and unresponsive with the loss of protective airway reflexes such as a cough and gag reflex. These patients are proverbial time bombs because they can suddenly become apneic, vomit and aspirate, or seize without any prior warning. Responding EMS providers should monitor the ABCs, administer oxygen, and be prepared to ventilate. Be prepared to suction. Look for possible injuries, try to identify the substances, contact medical control for further interventions, and transport. ALS should be considered for poisoning patients if available. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS, is defined as a sudden, unexplained death of an infant less than one year old. EMTs are not able to diagnose SIDS in the field. That diagnosis is made only after a complete autopsy with clinical history. SIDS occurs while the infant is sleeping, typically striking between two to four months of age. The number of incidents have decreased dramatically since emphasis has been placed on lying babies on their back to sleep, along with the removal of extra bedding and blankets within the crib. If involved on a SIDS call, it is important to remember that the scene will be investigated by law enforcement, so observation, attention to scene detail, and proper documentation will be crucial to assist in the investigation. Try to remember and document everything you see, touch, and hear. Do not disturb any evidence if it can be avoided. Some cases of suspected SIDS deaths turn out to be child abuse related, so gathering the story, timeline, signs, and symptoms is absolutely vital. Document the position of the patient at first discovery, the surface on which the infant was sleeping, the position of the patient upon EMS arrival, any caretaker resuscitation attempts, temperature of the room, 
what the infant was wearing, and if there have been any recent illnesses or medication changes. The choice to perform CPR in a SIDS case may be a difficult one. In CPR, you learn that obvious signs of death included rigor mortis, lividity, tissue decomposition, and injuries incompatible with life. CPR started with any one of these signs will prove to be unsuccessful and you can do more harm than good for the surviving family. The infant SIDS case can present a unique challenge, however. You may understand that CPR will not have an effect on the child, but it may help the grieving process for the parents. Typically, parents want everything possible tried to save their child. The decision to start CPR or not start CPR may be an ethical choice for you and your crew, or it may be defined by a local protocol. Actions that are performed on scene may help limit the what-if questions that come up during the grieving process. It helps give families solace that everything possible is done. On the other hand, your resuscitation attempts and subsequent transport will simply delay the inevitable, result in a greater financial burden for the parents or guardians, place the public at risk during transport of a non-viable patient, and possibly delay the start of the grievance process by giving them a false hope. Ultimately, each call is unique and the circumstances may dictate a different plan. Follow your local protocols and do not hesitate to contact medical control for guidance. Trauma is a leading cause of death in children over the age of one year old. Of the different mechanisms of trauma, blunt trauma is the most common in the pediatric population. Anatomical and physiological differences in the pediatric population drive what type of assessment and interventions should be completed, while also playing a major role in what equipment is used in the pre-hospital setting. Please review pediatric considerations within the trauma module of this course for additional information. Given your completion of this module, you should now be able to explain why pediatric patients need varying approaches to assessment and care, identify the developmental considerations for the following age groups, infants, toddlers, preschool, middle childhood, and adolescent. Consider the metabolic differences in providing care to the pediatric patient. Identify the anatomical and physiological differences to consider in the care of the pediatric patient in the following areas, head, airway, chest, lung, abdomen, extremities, integumentary system, respiratory system, circulatory system, nervous system, and spinal column. Summarize the components of the Pediatric Assessment Triangle, PAT. Describe the hands-on assessment of the ABCs. Identify the additional assessment techniques utilized in a sample history and secondary assessment. Predict the emotional reaction an EMT may have during and after a pediatric emergency. Describe general considerations of the assessment process utilized for the pediatric patient. List specific pathophysiology, assessment, and management of the following emergencies encountered in the pediatric patient. Respiratory distress, shock, neurological, gastrointestinal, toxicology, SIDS, and trauma. Explain the importance of including family members in the assessment and management of a pediatric patient. Explain the rationale for having knowledge and skills appropriate for dealing with a pediatric patient. Attend to the feelings of the family when dealing with an ill or injured pediatric patient. And understand the provider's own emotional response in caring for pediatric patients. You should also be able to conduct a pediatric patient interview and demonstrate the assessment of a pediatric patient. That concludes this module on pediatric patients. Please do not hesitate to contact your instructor with any questions. This presentation was created by Waukesha County Technical College with grant funding from the Wisconsin Technical College System.